Welcome to SoFlo by Lucas Millar. <laughs> Lucas's latest collection of 13 short stories, ranging from the gross and silly to heart wrenching thrillers of cosmic proportions. Join Lucas as he takes you beyond the beaches and shows you the dark side of the Sunshine State. Welcome to SoFlo, a collection of weird Florida horror by Lucas Millar. Available January 14th, 2024. Brought to you by the Evil Cookie Publishing. You know, John, I've been trying to tell him that every time we do a show, he needs to send us ice cream. You know, because like a nice little chat. We can have ice cream. We can have a nice friendly convo. I've been here a year and a month and have yet to get any ice cream. (laughs) I've been here for four. No ice cream. (laughs) I don't understand. I offered you some when you came to my house. Wow. I didn't actually have any of them. No, I was going to bring you somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was an empty promise. Oh my God. You wanted me to get back in a car after like nine hours. No thanks. Oh. Hello and welcome to Dead Headspace. If it's your first time here, please hit the subscribe and like button, all that awesome stuff. If you're returning, welcome back. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my friend, Brennan LaFaro. Say hello, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And our other friend, Candace Nola. Say hello, Candace. Hello, Candace. <laughs> Pretty sure that's the first time you did that. And... No, nope, it's not. You lost the count. Oh, okay. And uh, we're, we're joined by returning guest, John F.D. Taff. Say hello, John. Hello, John. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to. Got to do it. Hello, Candace. Hello, Pat. Hello, Brennan. Hello, hello sir. Thank you so, for having me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the last time you were on was when you were with, uh, um, who was it? Uh, John Lane and Josh Mallerman. Yep. For uh, Dark Stars. Right. That was over a year ago, at least over a year ago. Yep. Um. For those that don't know what Dark Stars is, just a real quick synopsis. Can you tell us what it what what, what that anthology entails? Yeah, it was a uh, sort of a tribute anthology to Dark Forces, which was one of the seminal horror anthologies of the early '80s, edited by Kirby McCauley, and it had uh, lots of big name authors: King, uh, uh, yeah, now I'm gonna forget. Um, well, I had a lot of big name authors. King was one of them. So we decided to do a tribute anthology because uh, it, it never really had a tribute anthology in the 40 or so years that it had been out. So we, I put together a bunch of authors, including Josh and Ramsey Campbell and Langan and a bunch of authors. Carolyn Kepneys. I didn't uh, know this at the time when we talked, but uh, Kirby McCauley was King's agent at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He then, actually, uh, it was he got his start as an agent, and then kind of segued into some anthology editing and and whatnot. So, uh, but it was a it was a anthology that was pretty important to me. It was one of the first anthologies in horror that really grabbed me. Um, so I wanted to do something that kind of spoke to that, and I I thought we did pretty well. I mean, I was very happy with the stories in it. Uh, one of the nice little bits of kismet is that King's story was that it, the stories were all short stories, but uh, King's story was a novella. And uh, so when we were putting together Dark Dark Stars, I wanted to have slightly longer stories so there'd be a little fewer of them. But uh, Langan wrote, as he always does, overwrote. And uh, his story was like twice as long as everybody else's, but it worked out really well because we're able to use it as a cap off for the, for the uh, entire anthology. And I think it worked really, really well. Yeah. That's a cool story. He's got a real neat way of uh, telling kind of like a folkloric tale in his, uh, what is it? The cat scales. Yeah. Nice little story in a story, what they call a classic two hander is what they call that. Yeah. Uh, And before we, get off of anthologies i don't know if we're gonna return but we had one question from uh a listener jordan yeah. whitlock uh he asked is he editing are you editing any more anthologies he really enjoyed the first two um 
I would love to. I'm not getting a lot of interest right now. Uh, Shane and I, Shane Keen and I are working on a, on something that to me sounds pretty cool. Uh, and I hope we're going to be able to do it because it, I think I see the cover in my mind perfectly in my mind. And I know exactly the kind of stories that we'd be going for. And I don't want to breathe a word about it because no one, it's such a, it's one of those ideas when, when I tell you about it, you're going to go, oh, somebody has to have done that. And they haven't. I've looked. They haven't. Very cool. It's a great idea. And so we'll see. There, You know, publishers are really funny about anthologies and fiction collections these days. So uh, it's hard to really get them to, to bite on one. But we'll see. I would love to. Yeah, I mean, man. I've had a good time editing the ones that I've worked on so far. Uh, the Bad Book, Morbidologies, Dark Stars. Uh, and then I had a, a hand in uh, the Seven Dead List, so I, I, you know, I've had I have a good time doing it. It it, uh, it fixes something within me that is not completely satisfied by writing. So mm. uh, it's a it's you know a slightly different skill set, and it it makes me feel good. You know, I came up through trade magazines and journalism, that kind of stuff, and did a lot of editing on that kind of stuff. So it still kind of makes me feel like I'm putting those skills to, to good use, but we'll see. We'll see if anybody is interested in doing anything. Absolutely. And John, I'll cut this if you want me to, but uh, in case someone's listening, the right person's listening, I'll just tease it at this. I mean, you talked about, well, we both love Peter Straub. What about a Peter Straub tribute anthology? Yeah, uh, I have a proposal put together for a Peter Straub tribute anthology that I, you know, again, I think uh, possibly because of the kind of people I'd be going after to submit stories and the kind of money that I would have to have to do that. I think it's kind of put the the publishers that I've approached it with off a little but we'll see. I mean, you 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 know as I do with you, Pat, that Pete, Peter Straw was a he informs everything I write. I mean, he's my go to writer. Uh, the Throat, which is his one of his novels in the the Blue Rose uh, series of books, is one of my favorite, hands down favorite books of all time. I try to go back and read it once a year. So I would love to do a tribute anthology for Peter. Absolutely. I don't think I'm smart enough to even pretend to emulate his work. He's just. <laughs> well, neither do I. He's another level. Uh, Brennan or Candace, you want to jump in? I do. I do. I do. So unintelligent question here before we start. Sure. What's the name of the little guy over there? He just walked right into the frame, and I'm oh, just and real, watching him. <laughs> real quick, for audio listeners, it's a little baby in a cage. It's a demon baby. Wow, <laughs> it's a little pug, and he's adorable. And he just sat down. The they don't know that. They can't see it. <laughs> That's Muriel. Nice. I have another one out over here on the dog bed that you ah. can't see. That's Hazel behind me. You got two of them. Yeah, well, and then there's another one out with my wife who's blind and, blind and deaf. So she's Aww. there on the couch. So, Love yeah, pugs. our little pugs. Little pugs. All right. So um, I'm going to jump right into the story here because, wow, okay. <laughs> um, let's start with you telling us a little bit about your two-minute pitch for the Plastic Space House. Hmm. You know, I... Uh, two-minute pitch. <laughs> wow. Or one. <laughs> you know, I I wanted to do something science fiction-y, but I still wanted to keep it directly in the horror, you know, milieu. But uh, so I've been reading a lot on uh, consciousness and reality and, and physics and all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to try to weave this all together into some sort of coherent story. So what if the the fears that mankind has uh, trap, traps mankind on this planet because the universe itself, which is conscious, doesn't want that stuff out out and about? I'm really I'm really bad at these. 
Me too. Really That's it. why I make other people do them. Exactly. You are smart. <laughs> there is no uh, reality. It's on the back cover. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, this is my way of trying to look at reality and consciousness as it pertains to fear. And, you know, fear is not just a, it's not just an emotion. It's, it can be primarily a negative emotion, even though we all write in it. And, uh, and it's an important part of, of the fiction we tell, uh, you know, in day-to-day life, I think fear in humanity is probably a pretty bad thing other than, you know, don't touch the stove because it'll burn you. Right. That kind of fear. Right. Um, so I, I, you know, tried to figure out some way to communicate that and then put it in a story that made sense and would be interesting to read. Uh, we'll see if I succeeded. I would say you did. Well, thank you. I would say you did. So, okay. So, two minute pitch. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm what? Really sucky. You're you know, fine. If, if you're watching this, don't take any notes from me on. How to <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at it. So, that all made it sound like you had a very complex tale to tell. And you did. There was an awful lot woven into there, and there were a lot of layers. Um, what for you was the most complex part of writing the story? I think that's yeah. Let's start with that. Well, I, you know, for me, it was two things. Uh, one was keeping the story you know, as grounded as you can, a, a story that's basically about there being no reality, you know, nothing is real, but trying to keep the story grounded so that there's at least a thread that the reader can follow through the story. But the other thing was, uh, if you've read any other stuff of mine, this story is very different from anything else that I've written. And part of that is because I've learned from Josh Mailerman, you know, th- that uh, having weird ideas and following those weird ideas is not necessarily a bad thing. And uh, so I kind of just let myself go on this, which was a hard thing for me to do as a writer. I've never really done that before. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, those are probably the two hardest things, you know, trying okay. to keep some sense of it, but also letting yourself go with an idea. Yeah. So on the opposite end of that, what did you find to be the most enjoyable portion of the story while you were writing it? I'm a big science fiction fan. So, and I've never really read, written any science fiction. So it was nice to put, you know, 50 years of ridiculous science fiction information from television shows and movies and books to some good use in a, in a fictional setting in a, in, you know, a book that I was working on. So that was kind of nice, you know, to do as what Star Trek calls techno babble, you know, in a story. (laughs) So that was kind of cool. You know, science fiction allows you to do that. Horror really doesn't. Mm -hmm. Sure. Fair point. Fair point. Um, All right. So John, I got to preface this by saying that, uh, I trust your storytelling implicitly, whether it's whether it's short stories, whether it's whether it's novels or novellas. Well, thank you. So, well, that's that's the preface. So here we go. Um, so <laughs> the thing is that I I am very hesitant to pick up space horror because I find that a lot of authors um, they either go Event Horizon or they go Alien, and there's a lot I've, I've just started too many books that don't have much more to add to the canon than those two kind of seminal works sure. do. And this, excuse me, this absolutely manages to steer around that. So well, I, I kind of wonder uh, with space horror in general, what tropes did you kind of actively look to avoid and what did you want to mainly include? Well, you know, like you said about a event horizon, I wanted to steer clear of, you know, projecting like religious tropes into space. So no space demons or, you know, portals to hell or anything like that. 
Um, I also didn't want to make it, I, I didn't want to turn it into a monster book. Not that there's anything wrong with a monster book. I just didn't feel like I needed or had anything to contribute to monster tales set in outer space. Um, but uh, yeah, so those were the biggies, I think, just to steer clear of those. And to try to steer clear, you know, science fiction has its own set of tropes that, you know, I haven't dealt with a lot since I don't write science fiction. Uh, so it was kind of an interesting thing to navigate steering clear of the science fiction tropes, but also trying to steer clear of the horror tropes, too. And still, at the end of the day, having a science fiction book that's also a horror book. So it was a, it was a lot to navigate. A lot of uh, very careful ship work there. Um, all right. I, I want to ask this. And if you don't want to go there, uh, Patrick can uh. cut this. But I, I do wonder if you'd like to talk about some of the um, meta aspects of the book. Well, um, yeah. I mean, I know what you're talking about. Should I just go out and say it? Oh, th that's your call, man. Okay, so I injected myself into the book. There's a, a certain point at which in the story, as as I was writing it, where I realized that if you're going to open this thing up to multiple different kinds of realities and where anything is, at all is possible, then one of the things I felt like I had to deal with was the possibility that, you know, these characters were are characters in a written story. And how would these characters as real people deal with the knowledge that they were also characters in a written story? So I felt like I had to, I, and I really wrestled with it. I talked to my wife about it. I talked to some other people about it. But then, you know, I, I also went back to the original idea, whereas, you know, if, if you've got this idea and you think it's a pretty good idea, but it also, it scares you a little to do it, to just go ahead and do it. So I felt like I should. Go ahead and write it and see if it hung together and made sense. And to me, it did. I, I mean, I showed it to a bunch of people w with the idea that it was an easy enough chapter to to excise. If I if I got a lot of feedback from people saying that no, this is too, it's too a little too on the nose, meta. But uh, so you know, hopefully, I kind of skirted that. I. I I mean, I think it was a legit reason uh, to do it. And I think it, I thought it hung pretty well with the story. Now I'm not the reader, so I don't get to have the final say about that. But no, I, 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 I had a lot of fun. Worked. Yeah, I had a lot. And, and, and there was a, um, there's a, there's a tightrope walk to it because as you say it serves the story it's not just in there to be in there to right. serve, serve the ego of Taft it needs to be in there but also there's a sense of fun to it and yeah. I wonder how you approached portraying yourself is that something you struggled with or was that kind of just this is how it's got to be right off the bat I thought that uh, it was it, the scene was pretty easy for me to write because I thought that I could hear Harlan's voice, the character Harlan's voice in my head pretty clearly. So I kind of knew how she would respond to certain things. So putting her in, in a situation where she's going to meet somebody who theoretically wrote her story or wrote part of her story and use her as a character, I felt pretty sure I knew she, how she would react to that and what she would say. So, you know, with me, with me being the character in the book, it's probably a little bit more characterized. Hold on, I've got a pug fight going on. I don't know what the hell's going on. He's a stop. You hear them all running around behind me? I can, hear, their, I can hear the leash. I mean, their uh, collar. <clears throat> anyway, so it wasn't necessarily hard. I mean... I didn't want to come off too cartoonish either, you know, to make myself seem like too much of a cartoonish character, but also, you know, how would a person, how would a person like me who writes stories for a living, how would they react if they were presented, even if in, in a situation where they thought it was a dream where you're, you know, you're interacting with characters that you have quote unquote created. 
So it was a little bit, it was a bit of a tight rope, but I, I felt pretty good about it. I, and, and like I said, if I had gotten poor feedback or, or people rolled their eyes too much after they read it, I would have more been more than happy to take it out. It just seemed to work. You know, the other thing that is really kind of funny about it is then, and, and I know probably everybody that writes in horror at one point or another is confronted with, uh, Stephen King did this once. Yeah. Do I really want to do this? <laughs> yeah. And and that was part a big part of the decision. I mean, it is totally nothing like the way that King did it in uh the Dark Tower series, but you know, the thought did go through my head, do I really want to do this? It's been it's been done at least in a certain way by, you know, the master of the the genre. So, uh, but, you know, I think all in all, with the feedback I got from most readers before we published it, and also uh, Scarlett, the editor at Trepidatio, I felt pretty good about leaving it in. Yeah. Did uh, did your, did your Mallerman-esque attitude kind of uh, trump that idea of, you know, King's done this, so I shouldn't? Like, they just go nuts with it? I th- yeah, I think when I finally was able to get rid of that, it was more just like this is different. I'm doing it different, and it's a, it it it's not just a it's not a tribute to what he did in the Dark Tower. It's not a play on what he did in the Dark Tower. It just fits this story. It was a it was it was a good fit for the story I was telling. It made sense, you know, in the box that I created to put the story in. So, so I let it ride. I liked yeah, your, <laughs> your your reaction, the tweet that you put out afterwards. That's what I'm looking for. That's sort of well, like... Oh. Very genuine, man, because I did not, you know, the second... I, I had to go back and, and reread because I, I said, there's, no, there's no way... Yep, yeah, that's... <laughs> so to catch the reader off guard, but in a way that you were you know you 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 have that initial surprise and then you well not anymore because we just spoiled the shit out of it but um <laughs> but you have well, now you have to go surprise. by the book and read it yeah there you go exactly um but then you know after you process it for a second it's like well yeah okay uh given what we have experienced and the stunning weirdness up to this point this actually makes a lot of sense this makes yeah. as much sense as anything that you know has led to this point and will come after. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to hear that because that was kind of the what I was shooting for. Um, it, it just seemed to make sense. Richard Chismar did it phenomenally well in Chasing the Boogeyman and Becoming the Boogeyman. Yeah, I haven't read that yet. The great. Um, so was there more challenges in writing in a genre that you have been a huge fan of for pretty much your whole life but uh well yeah you know i think it was just the 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 mental part of it trying to you know because you obviously you write something you want there to be an audience at the end of this to read it and how do i find that audience you know how do we find that audience to put this book in front of them to to get them to read it and how do I make it enough horror within the science fiction to not put off the horror audience that I've spent, you know, 30 years of my life trying to build for myself. So, (laughs) you know, I think that there was a lot of wrestling with that so that it would not become too, too much this or too much that it's that trying to get that nice, center ball in the bowling alley you know trying to put the right spin on it what's your takeaway after doing this um you know i've got another idea for a uh science fiction horror movie that sort of is in the same not movie i said movie a book that's sort of in the same kind of milieu it's not it's not in any way a continuation of that story it's not a sequel or anything but it's kind of centering around the same ideas about consciousness and and whatnot and you know i'd like to write it uh i'm just trying to think of who would be interested in it <laughs> because it was really hard placing this book i got you you know everybody was like yeah it's interesting but uh yeah yeah i remember you telling me glad that uh, trying to sell it. glad that trepidatio took a chance with it and mm-hmm. they, they've done a phenomenal phenomenal job i mean scarlet has been fantastic work to work with and they came up with a great cover 
Mm-hmm. That was the other thing that I was thinking of is, you know, how, what are they going to get to illustrate this, co- you know, this book that's going to make any sense on the cover. So when they showed me the artwork, I'm like, yeah, that's, I think that's pretty good. Yeah. A lot of the books kind of like a fever dream, but uh, I mean, yeah. that's by, I imagine that's by design. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think maybe at some point I'll go back and I may take a crack at this other book, but I think for right now it's, you know, I kind of made a, a commitment this year to uh, go back to uh, writing mostly short stories. Hmm. Nice. Because I feel like my strength is is really more of as a short story writer. Doesn't pay anything, but... <laughs> Uh, so I, I, and I, it's been a long time since I've actually had a, a stable of short stories that I was submitting, you know, actively submitting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I thought that I want to get back, I want to get back to doing that again. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm probably, I've, I've started a short story this week and I'm trying to get to the, uh, one short story a week. For at least a little while until I can build up maybe about a dozen of them. And then I I had uh, a short story before I had the stroke last year. Yeah, the stroke. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a short story collection completed uh, with some previously published stuff and some new stuff. And I went back and tore that up and just kind of took, took it all apart. And I'm going to rewrite all the new stuff for that collection. So uh, I feel pretty good about that. Nice. So we'll see about novels. I mean, I was working on a ghost story, a haunted house book uh, that I just couldn't, didn't seem to get too much into. It wasn't really grabbing me. So, and I think that's always a good sign to, you know, as good as I thought the idea was to just put it aside for a while and work on some other things and see if I can come up with a different angle, a different approach, different idea that I can wed to it and sort of uh, spark something within me to to finish that. But short stories for a while, I think. Short short fiction, short stories, mm-hmm. novellas, that kind of thing. Uh, do you guys have any more questions about Plastic Space House? No. Okay. Um, I would like to hear you talk about the uh, anthology that you and Shane Douglas King just came out with. Morbid allergies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a, a you know Shane and I have known each other for a long time, and Shane was always a Shane was one of the probably the earliest supporters of my my stuff. And when he moved into this direction where he was starting to write write poetry and and uh, get more involved in horror as a genre, um, he kind of approached me with this idea that he had. And I was looking for, I was looking to do something to follow up Dark Stars, and I liked, I liked the kind of the elevator pitch that Shane gave me, which is, you know, that people having obsess obsessive stuff about about whatever it is in their life, you know, obsessive stuff that borders on horror. Um, so he had slung a few author names past me and. I slung a few past him. So we, you know, like we do when you start an anthology, you just start, you know, we put together a pitch sheet and then we just put together a list of authors that we'd like to work with. And we just start approaching them with it. Just, you know, would you be interested? Do you have the time? Um, this is where we're, you know, thinking about going with it. It's hard too, when you don't really have it sold, you know, so what do you do? And I've done it both ways. Do you, you know, you sell it first, then you go out and get the authors, or you get the authors first, and then you use the author list to sell the book. Mm. Um, it's definitely easier if you have the author list prior to selling the book. It makes it easier to sell it, but it makes it harder to get those authors in line when you don't have a publisher lined up. So they both present challenges. Uh, but we did the uh, we did the uh, sell it to the publisher first, and then approach the uh, approach the authors with a you know it's definitely going to be published, and here's who's going to be publishing it. So that made it a little easier to get to the authors that we wanted. And you know, with me, you know, 
probably more so with Shane. I think that uh, after 30 years in this business, I afford myself the luxury of only working with people that I want to work with. Yeah. So, and I, I don't mean that to sound because it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm going, you know, after the, the high fruit all the time. And, I, you know, I just, if I think somebody is, is writing in a way that I like, or they're easy to work with, they're, they're fun to work with. I know that they're not going to be a problem. Um, because life is too short. <laughs> so Nothing you know, Mayberry folks, said yeah. perfectly. He said he doesn't work with the uh, prima donnas. Yeah. Well, why, why do you want to? I mean, no. it's, <laughs> yeah. it's too short and there's plenty of good people out there to work with. And that's yeah. kind of the way I look at it. I mean, I, you know, I've been doing this for 30 plus years and I've worked with a lot of different people. And I think there have been probably less than one handful of people that I just will not work with anymore for one, one reason or another. And uh, most everybody else has been super nice in this industry and super easy to work with. Nice. Um, so, you know, I like to, I like to work with people I haven't worked with before. Mm -hmm. um, and if I think that I can bring something to the table as an editor, then that's another reason to, to bring them in. And we've had really good luck. I mean, you know, Shane and I, it was pretty much every, I think, one person ended up dropping from the book and uh we'll go into that but it wasn't for any nefarious reason she was just busy so um everybody else was pretty excited about it and delivered what i thought were great stories nice candace do you have anything to add being a fellow anthologist um actually no <laughs> okay. but i had another question that i was going to like get sure. into. um only because i said no because one i mean you pretty much now i can't talk thanks pat um we're gonna blame him because i can't talk now good going pat you covered everything that i think i would have asked anyway and i know this is one of those things that we also whenever on the stoker panel that we were on as well mm -hmm. I, I think you and i are a lot on the same page when it comes to how to put one up and how to edit it and who to work with and why and yeah you know, the best folks to work with um but i do want to talk about your experiences in the business and since you've just mentioned you have a long-standing um long-standing history in the business you're an icon in the business. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. Yes, I said the I word, and you are considered <laughs> one of the icons of the industry, uh, sir. So that being said, a couple of things there. What has been one or two of your most memorable par parts of your journey? Um, within that time frame, I know it's a lot, so feel free to shout out one or two or three. <laughs> and then also, what advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out maybe one to five years in? Like, what would you tell them if someone finds themselves suddenly like struggling with are they good enough? Should they continue? Like, how do you keep going in the face of rejections and the competition and the perceptions. Yeah. And I guess the first thing I'd say is, you know, even after 30 years, I still have plenty of periods of time where I just feel like, why am I doing this? You know, it's, nothing is working out the way that I want it to. Maybe I should just sit down and call it a day. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has those things. And, yeah. uh, you just got to find a way to work your work yourself around it. And I know it's hard, but I came through last year with uh, kind of a, that kind of a period myself where even after 30 years, I'm thinking to myself, wow, do I really want to do this anymore? Uh, things are changing and I don't feel I can get my stuff out the way that I want it to. Uh, but, you know, you have to, you have to make a decision. I think at some point, about why you're doing this. And mm -hmm. I know that early on in writing, uh, probably about 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, 
I did stop. I I threw up my engine. You know, this isn't working. I got better used to spend with all this time that I was spending away from my family. Um, and I stopped writing for seven years and it was the worst period of my t- my life. Uh, I took a mental health hit because of it. Um, it was just awful. And so when I got back into writing, I made a promise that I would not stop again. Um, I've had to make, you know, you have to make do with the fact that, okay, you're probably not going to be a million dollar author and, and that's got to be okay. Because for me, the writing itself is, is what I'm in it for. And, you know, yeah, I want to get my writing across to as many people as I possibly can. But, uh, you you know, you can only do what you can do and you got to kind of work, work at it. And it comes in increments. And there are people that get struck by lightning. They There are. And I think too many people look at those people and they say, that's exactly what needs to happen to me before I consider this, before I consider myself to be successful. Mm. Um, but that's just, it doesn't happen that often. You know, right. you look at the top of the industry right now, the top of the horror books, and it's it's maybe five, six people. Yeah. And that's kind of the way it's always been. And it's not, I don't think there's anything defeatist in that. And I don't think there's anything sour grapes in that. It's just the way it is. But I have had to sit down and figure out why it is that I want to write and then be comfortable with that reason. And so that's, you know, that's kind of the biggest piece of advice I would give to anybody is just, you know, hang in there. And, you know, if you've got a a support group of some kind, whether that's your family or other writers or friends or whatever that is, lean on them uh, when you go through these kind of times and, you know, it's important to have people around you. I mean, it's nice to have your mom if she reads your stuff and says that's great. But it's nice to have some people around you who will read your stuff and give you honest, honest critiques. Hmm. Um, so that when they come back to you and they say what you're writing is worthwhile and it's interesting and it's exciting and you should keep doing it, you can believe them. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Because it and it's hard to find those people. Like, I know it really is. I mean, uh, yeah, friends, you know, because they, yeah. they don't want to hurt your feelings. Right. They don't want to be like, no, I didn't like it. Really important. You don't want a whole, whole team of yes men. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's nice to have that. You should have. That. I mean, yeah. hopefully, yeah. your mother is. Hopefully, at least your mom or your a parent or somebody is reading your stuff and saying that's nice. But you really got to yeah. have people around you that you can trust that. You know, if it's not nice. They can tell you that too in a in a you know non hurtful way. But uh, right. Right. you know, stick with it. Stick with it. Read a lot. Read a lot, and read a lot outside your genre, so that you kind of have a more of a breadth of information that you can draw on. I know that I uh, come up with some of my best ideas when I'm not reading horror when I'm reading something else that's horror, you know, doesn't have any, any kind of ties to horror. It, it'll mm. give me an idea that, that I can turn into a horror idea. But, yeah. you know, if you're reading too much horror and nothing else, I think uh, to me, at least I would be a little concerned about where my ideas are coming from. If I were just reading horror. Sure. Uh, and what was the second part of that? Oh, my memory. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, at least, it has been the uh, the encounters that I've had with writers that I respect, um, you know, writers that I grew up reading. Um, Straub is one of them. I never met him in person, but uh, I had a pretty good uh, email relationship with him. And we chatted every once in a while. And we tweeted back and forth every once in a while. And uh, he was charming and he was nice and he was funny and he was very encouraging. Um, and I think, you know, to find out that there are people that you, you know, revere as a writing God that are, you know, encouraging and supportive of, of, of your journey as a writer, regardless of what that journey is, uh, that has been particularly uh 
pleasing to me to find out because I know that there's a whole thing about don't meet your heroes because you're, you know, you're going to be disappointed, but that's kind of been not been the, the case that I found so far. The people I've met, I, uh, I was at uh, StokerCon in Grand Rapids. What was that? 2019. And uh, I was walking around with Brian Kirk. I don't know if you know Brian Kirk. Um, and uh, it was, you know, it was probably about nine o'clock at night. And we were walking around this huge hotel. And there were very few people out. And we walked through this kind of out of the way seat sitting area. And uh, Robert McCammon was sitting over there by himself. You know who Robert McCammon is, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Boys live. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Brian was like, let's go over and talk to Robert McCann. Let's, okay. So we went over there and talked with him. And then Brian, who was completely drunk, wandered away at some point. And I was left there with uh, Robert McCammon by myself. We sat down and talked. He couldn't have been nicer. Couldn't have been more pleasant. He I, he asked me for a copy of The Fearing, which is the book that I had out at that time. And he took it and read the first two books of it that night in his hotel room, found me the next day and was, you know, gushing and eventually offered me a blurb for it. So, holy shit, you know, when you when it's that kind of a thing, these kind of unexpected encounters that you would have with somebody who who's writing you would really admire mm. and they're not an asshole and. Over and above the fact they're just not an asshole, they're very encouraging and they're very supportive and they're very friendly. That to me has kind of been my uh, experience with almost everyone in horror. Like I said, there's only been a couple people in 30 years that I just, you know, flat I would not work with anymore. Yeah. Um, I've had, you know, lots of near misses along the way with with different books that I had over the years. Uh that kind of kept me going, but uh, you know that that's kind of been the the big thing is just meeting people that you really admire and finding out that they're you know humans just like you and they're nice people and you know and I hope you know that's one of the things I mean I hope that when I go to shows or when I am in uh, on social networks or you know, anything like that, that I make myself accessible and I, and I'm friendly and accommodating and, you know, cause that's the way that I wanted those people to be when I met them. And I want to be that way for whoever thinks it's a big charge to meet me. <laughs> you have been icon that I am. You have been yeah. Yeah. me. I, I told well, you. Thank you. I, I look, it. Yeah. It's important. Can- Candace is someone I look up to too, whether she was a friend or not, whether you were a friend or not, John. I think you guys are great writers, great well, anthologists. So, well, I, 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 I'm a rookie. It's important to be to be friendly and encouraging and supportive of people. Yeah. You know, unless they bite you or something. <laughs> or, well, in that case, you know. Yeah, exactly. Bite but, back. <laughs> you know, most everybody it's the weird thing. I think that the weird thing about horror is that People think of the horror, you know, people outside of the horror genre think of the horror genre. They think, what a bunch of weirdos. They're probably weird and off putting and not very friendly. Smell bad and yeah, <laughs> yeah all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, black all the time. There's not, you know, nothing could be further from the case, I don't think. Yeah. In, in my experience. You, you know what I, I found in just people that I have met in my few short years out Mm -hmm. here that that perception is 100% true but I've also found that now I'm on the inside of that and I have met so many different authors and everything I think we're some of the nicest folks out there and the most encouraging and supportive is the key word Because the majority of us, not everybody, but the majority have gone through some very hard things in our lives. Yeah. We're putting those elements into the stories we write. We're processing 
our experiences in the stories we write. And when we see someone else approaching us, one soul recognizes another. We know our kind. And when we, we can recognize someone who's been there, you know that look. And I think that's why we're, as a, as a group, are more supportive than well, maybe think, some of the other groups. Yeah, horror is a very empathic genre, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're right. Most horror writers are writing at least some portion of what they're writing is based on personal experience, grief, yeah. you know, yeah. sorrow, you know, that kind of stuff. Whereas if you're writing science fiction, you're not writing that from, a, you know, I've been in a spacecraft and jetting around the universe. Right. Uh, so, I, yeah, I think you're right. And I think that people tend to be people write horror tend to be a little bit more open to other people and forgiving uh, and and empathetic yeah I think it shows yeah you guys want to move to currently reading sure all right john what are you currently reading i am reading uh michael wayhunt's collection the inconsolables um is that new yeah it, i think it came out about uh four or five months ago hmm. bad Bad handbooks. Um, and if you've not read any of Michael Wayhunt's short fiction, it's really phenomenal. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think it may have made the. I think the you might have made yeah. the Stokers. That it's sounds a, right. It, it's a really nice book. It's a really phenomenal book. Nice. Uh, Candace, what are you currently reading? Six to two. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're usually reading like 20 different things. Oh, um, uh, what am I reading? <laughs> I'm commands. currently reading oh, one of 19 it. books, you know, since you want to tell all my secrets right now. <laughs> I'm currently reading That Was My Nickname in High School by Armand Rosamila. His new collection mm -hmm. came out. I'm reading that. I'm reading one of my new author's manuscripts right now and getting that ready for publishing, which is a fantastic story called Episodes of <laughs> Violence. Again, blaming Pat because I can't talk. <laughs> and that is by David Bernstein. It's an extreme horror story, but it's like action packed. It reads like a. Um, crime movie almost like it's very fast paced a lot of ac action in there but there's plenty of horrific situations within it as well it's not a supernatural sort of thing it's not a slasher it's just some people just gone nuts <laughs> it's great so those are my main two reads right now nice brennan uh, I am reading Things We Lost in the Fire by uh, Mariana Enriquez, oh, a yeah. short story collection, and it is phenomenal. Every single story in there hits. Um, there, there, there's the opener of the collection is called The Dirty Kid, and it's just there's a, a poignancy to it and a, and a kind of, um, uh, I want to say human aspect. That's not... That's not what I'm looking for, but there's just this this kind of gritty realism, humanist aspect to it that just it hits and it just sticks with you yeah. afterward. And the way she can balance, you know, kind of authentic life with the supernatural and just have the monsters lurking in the background, it's it's pretty it's unique and it's really, really something special. Um, I'm also reading a book called The Sisters Brothers. Uh, by Patrick DeWitt um, and the kind of blurb on the back says that it's Cormac McCarthy if he had a sense of humor and that's <laughs> absolutely stunningly perfect uh, it's it's got a little bit of like uh, true grit blood to it as well uh, it's a really it's a really fun book Patrick nice. uh, yeah so I am halfway through Richard Adams uh, Warship Down it's the first time I read it I've wanted to read it for a few years now and um i had a audio credit i'm like you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna pull the trigger and then uh i am uh, i don't know how far along but i am reading uh brennan's upcoming book called the denizens and it's uh he told me about it i think like 
three years ago and I always felt like it was special and just going to be probably one of the best things I've read by him. And, and it's true so far. It's uh, I'm not going to say anything about it because it's not coming up for some time, but it, it, to me, it's one of the best things he he's written. My favorite so far to date, my favorite short story that he's ever written is with a uh, sort of Kansas mythology, uh, dark disasters. It's, it's wonderful. And uh, Peter Straub was an influence on that too, to some extent. Um, and I'll just say, I'll just say that because it's a short as far story. As, I so can, I as far as I can stretch it, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but, uh, Patrick. yeah. Um, all right. So where can people follow you, John? Where can people find me? Um, mm -hmm. Mostly these days on Twitter. I've got a, my website is kind of stalled. I'm looking at redoing it. So, uh, Twitter at John F.D. Taff. Uh, I'm pretty approachable, so anybody can hit me up anytime there. I call it Twitter too still. I always will, but yeah. uh, do you think it pisses Elon Musk off every time? Because he's got to see that shit all the time. That and I would leave it a heartbeat if I thought there was a viable alternative, but... Yeah. Uh, it's like if you change Walmart to or Target's name, like it's been that for so long. No one's I hate I hate Facebook, so I. I don't know. <laughs> okay, hey, before uh, we get off, are you? Have you? Have any of you guys started to watch True Detective Night Country? Oh, I want to see that. It looks, I love Jodie uh, Foster. I haven't seen it yet. No. I'm not dying to start talking about that. Now, do you have to watch the previous seasons to? No, have... although there have been a little uh, some threads in this one. It's only two episodes in so far, hmm. but. There's some threads in it that sort of tie back to the first season with Matthew McConaughey and and uh, Woody. Mm. It's pretty good so far. I, I'm a sucker for uh, horror stuff that's set in uh, Arctic environments. You know, mm. that cold. There's something really spooky to me about that kind of setting. Or that, there can be something really spooky to me about that kind of a setting. Yeah, that's yeah. what hell looks I like, man. What? What? That I got a story for you set in the art setting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just kidding. Oh. Shameless plug for the Were Bear book. Oh. From Bishop, but you know, <laughs> set in Alaska in the middle of winter. Just you know, putting myself out there. That'll do it. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah, anyway. Bishop. Bishop. Oh. Bishop one and two is a good. Good book. Uh, where are you currently? I mean, where can people follow you? Jeez, I can't think. Uh, where can people mm -hmm. follow you, Candace? Okay, so two part answer here. So if you want to follow me, you can find me at CandaceNolaAuthor.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Blue Sky, Facebook, all the social media. And if you want to follow the publishing in the website, it's under Uncomfortably Dark. Brennan. Brennan That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Short and to the point. Yeah, exactly. You follow, you follow me on uh, Twitter, uh, Blue Sky Threads, Instagram, PR McDonough. Um, final thoughts, Mr. Taff. Well, I, you know, thank you guys for reading the book. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, it was neat. It was a well, I appreciate it. Like you said, different than anything I've read about you before. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully uh, this will draw up a little uh, traffic over to Amazon or wherever people get their their books. And Because I'm, you know, over and above my just need as an author to have people read it, I'm really interested to hear what people think about it hmm. and what it makes them think about when they read it. So, uh, you know... Read it. You want to approach me on Twitter and let me know what your thoughts are. I I would I'd love that. There you go. Uh, follow up with that, people. Candice, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Plastic space house. Unpredictable, enjoyable, trippy in a good way. <laughs> Buy it, read it, love it. Let this man know what you think. Um, thank you, sir, for your time, for your thank words, you. for your uh, your wisdom, and <laughs> you know, just for hanging out with us. And well, so I love hanging out with you guys and talking. It's been a blast. 
Okay. Brennan. And hopefully I'll be able to see all of you at an upcoming event sometime. That'd be great. At sure. some point. At some point. Yeah. Um, so I'd throw out that uh, if you are a science fiction horror slash space horror fan, definitely make room for this because it, it's it's it adds new stuff to the canon. It it goes uh, <laughs> it goes uh, past the furthest reaches of space. <laughs> uh, but here's the thing: is if you don't, if that's not your cup of tea, check it out anyway for the exact same reason. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. not gonna tiptoe down the same avenues that drove you away from that drive you away from that genre in the first place. Um, it 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 brings something new to the table, which is not something you can with with the sheer amount of horror fiction in the in the world. Not something you get to say every day. So, John, Thank pleasure you. hanging out with you, man. Anytime. Thank you, man, bro. I appreciate it, bro. Uh, Shane. He actually replied to that person that asked you that question earlier. And uh, he just said he just might be um, referring to, are you going to edit uh, any more anthologies? He said, but we'll wait and see what he says about it. So Shane, if you're listening to that full circle moment, um, final thoughts are John. Love you, buddy. We all enjoy hanging out with you. Yeah. You should really narrate books because you got one of the best voices. My wife tells me the same thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. You can probably get away as long as you got a smile on. You can probably get away with like just <laughs> kind of narrating people what to do if you want them to get away if they're being annoying. Right. No jokes, <laughs> Brian or Candace. Um, yeah. But thank you for your time. Oh, no problem. It's been great talking to you guys. <laughs> and uh, next episode is two thirty two, oh. best of season four. That's gonna be with me, Brennan and Candace. We're gonna talk about best of season four, some of our favorite books from uh, last year. So stay tuned for that. And uh, as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.